Welcome back. You're watching Between the Lines and joining us today is Ed Reed. He's the author of the recent Faith and Finance, Faith Combined with Finance to help us to be what the Bible calls good stewards. Mm -hmm. Ed, you were talking about student loans before we went to break. Talk, yes. talk to us a little As bit more I about that. As I mentioned earlier, getting an education is very valuable in the so-called cycle of life. In other words, it's preparatory for the whole rest of it. And uh, sometimes uh, people do not have the money to get an education. So I tell them, work all you can, get all the scholarships and grants that you can, but if there's still a shortfall, it's better to get a, a student loan than not finish college. But I would tell people, when you fill out the application at the student aid office, and they call you in a couple weeks after you've get, submitted all the information, your 1040 forms for your parents and all that stuff, they will call you and say, guess what, you qualify for 10,000. And guess what most students do? They take the 10000 10, yeah. Even though they could have gotten through the year for 3500 You understand? Mm -hmm. You have to pay this back with interest. Mm -hmm. And if you have a government-backed student loan, I just want to tell you the downside of it, even if you file for bankruptcy, you cannot discharge any child support or alimony, any taxes you owe the government, and guess what the third one is? Student loans you still owe them after you file for bankruptcy. So the whole point is, it's valuable to get your education, particularly if you're getting an education for something where there'll be a job when you're done, something you qualify for well and so on. At any rate, uh, but only borrow the minimum amount you need and then pay it off as quickly as possible. That's what I would suggest in student loans. Now people have a lot of major purchases that they make in life and, and you cover that in, in chapter seven that deals with major purchases, housing, automobiles. Sure. How do people go about making those types of acquisitions without getting into debt as society has basically structured us to do? My suggestion, oh, by the way, the Bible's suggestion about long-term indebtedness is that we should not be in debt longer than seven years. That's Deuteronomy 15, verse 1. But the interesting part about it is uh, they probably didn't anticipate the great inflation. You know, houses in, in our area, the area where I live, are 500000 or so. Mine's not one of those kind, but my, all of my neighbors have big houses. Well, why do houses cost so much? They cost so much because credit is available. If credit were not available, houses would cost only about one-fourth of what their current market is. One of the reasons we know that is because how much, how much p do people put down on their current house anyway? And I'm going to tell you a strong statement. Most of the people who are getting foreclosed upon, except for those that have lost their jobs, but otherwise, are people who had no down payment at all got 100% financing for houses that they couldn't afford because they were encouraged to do by greedy mortgage brokers. I'll just tell you that's what happened. That's why the thing is imploding. Now we're having people lose their jobs and of course they can't make their payments that they could handle normally otherwise. But here's the best way not to get in trouble. The first one is to put at least 20% down. Now this is a lot of money, but that means you would save it up. And the reason that you do that is you save private mortgage insurance, which can add like 150 or $200 a month to your bill every month. And the interesting part about that, that benefits the lender, not you. You know, if your house burns down, you still have to have casualty insurance, and the lender requires that of you as well. But the private mortgage insurance, you could save like $200 a month by just having a 20% down payment. Another thing is if you have that kind of a down payment, you hardly ever would get upside down in your mortgage, which means you would owe more than the house is worth. So at some point in the future, I mean, in the D.C. area where we live, you know, housing has only gone down about 12% overall. So if you had a 20% down payment, you could not lose money if you had to sell now. You get the point? I mean, right. the whole idea is make sure it's something you can manage. And uh, I mentioned the seven-year thing, but what I encourage people to do is to get a mortgage that you know you can handle, like a 15-year mortgage or even a 30-year mortgage, but then do your best to prepay principal so that you can pay it off in a reasonable time. But now let's talk about automobiles because yeah. that's something people have gotten into long-term debt too as well. Oh, yes. Well, the interesting thing is that typical uh, new car purchase today uh, should be or, or typically are five or even six years long. And they will tell you, well, the payments are like two sixty nine a month or something. But they don't tell you you're going to do that for six, five or six years. And the interesting part about it is most people that are making time payment on an automobile actually owe more on it than it's worth. Almost right. all mm -hmm. people who are buying cars with payments owe more on it than it's worth, which means they're upside down on the mortgage the day they start off with it, which is really, really incredible. So I encourage people, first of all, nowadays we can shop on the Internet. I mean, so you know exactly right. what the car is worth and what others are selling for like it. Make sure 
sure you're getting a good deal. That's the first thing that you think about. But then have a, a down payment so that you can get the, the payments down again, and then to make sure that you have a reasonable income. We don't all have to drive BMWs and, and Mercedes. You know, you can drive a, you know, Honda or a Toyota or a Chevy or whatever it might be. What we're talking about is basic transportation. So the the sales market and the TV would like instead of selling the qualities of the car now, they're trying to say what your neighbors think about your car. Isn't that true? You see it those is. kind of it ads. Is. But you know, you know the thing I'm thinking about when I listen to the way that you're talking about how we should approach all of these things. Yeah. You're really saying that we should be a, a great deal more intentional. Oh yeah. And we need to take the greed aspect, the competitive nature that is a part of society, out of our thinking if we're going to be in complement with what God wants us to do with with money. I have a whole section on buying a car in the in the book in that chapter on making major purchases. But one of the things that I would encourage people to do is anyone who's just made the last payment on their car. Guess what time of that is for most. people? people, time to get another car. But if instead you kept making payments into a savings account, then when you do really need to buy a car, you have a huge chunk and can pay cash even for cars. That's what I've done. The last two cars I've bought, I paid cash for them. By the way, the salesperson almost dies on the day that happens. Right. You know, <laughs> which plan do you want? Well, I plan to write a check and they can <laughs> hardly believe it. And then they try to talk you out of it, believe it or not, because sure. they make money on the mortgage, as you mm. understand. Sure. But at any rate, Planning really makes a big, big difference. We can't just say, well, we're going to walk everywhere. In the United States, you probably need a car, especially if you live in an urban area where you have to drive to work or whatever, if there's no metro transportation available and so on, and you need a place to live. And we should seek, I think, the security of home ownership so you have a place. And uh, we can talk a little bit about retirement in a few minutes and how to plan for that because a lot of things people have had big problems with. But I can tell you there's some good information in the book about how to get ready for retirement. And thank you for bringing it up because right. that's okay. exactly what we want to talk about. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, we want to pick it up talking, Heather, about retirement. Ed, thank you again for being with us. This is extremely important. And thank you for joining us. Stay with us. We're going to take a break. We're talking with Ed Reed about faith and finance, how to better manage your money in God's way. For more information about any of the books presented today on Between the Lines, visit your local Adventist Book Center or go online at www.adventistbookcenter.com. If you are interested in receiving a copy of today's book, and live in the United States and Canada, call 1-800-765-6955. That's 1-800-765-6955. 